Three, two, one. Hey there folks, just doing a quick sound check here before we get started. If you're at home, get comfy, curl up on the couch, or maybe you're outside in the patio, it's super nice out. Hey folks! Well, welcome to our impromptu uh, presentation about ducks. Um, so if you're just tuning in today um, and uh, you're one of our nature guardian families, you know that we were supposed to be out at Shuby Park earlier today uh, putting up a uh, nest box for a wood duck uh, to uh, follow up on some other conservation action projects we've led there over the last, oh I guess it's been I guess it's been almost three years now since we've started uh, a couple of different stewardship projects at Shuby. Um, yeah, but of course that couldn't go ahead because of the new restrictions within the HRM. So we thought we might as well keep it safe and uh, stay home and, and learn about ducks as best we can uh, virtually. Um, so I have our friend Emma here, um, who I know our nature guardians have met before. Um, for folks who haven't met Emma before, if you haven't met me before, I guess. So I'm Becky. I'm with the Young Naturalist Club. And Emma is one of our awesome friends uh, who works at Ducks Unlimited Canada, and she's been out with the Nature Guardians YNC chapter quite a couple times now, Emma. Uh, I'm putting you on the screen there. I know you can't see me. We can see you. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, so Emma knows a whole lot about wetlands. She's full of fun facts, and uh, hopefully she's going to tell us some cool stuff about ducks today. So duck ID is something that um, I'm really passionate about. I found ducks really hard until last year when I forced myself to draw a bunch of them and that really helped my ID skills. Um, so yeah, we're going to share some tips for IDing ducks um, and some cool facts about our local duck species that we have here. What kinds of uh, research is informing uh, what we know about them, what scientists know about these ducks, uh, and some tips for how you can be a duck steward at home. So yeah, so with that, I'll, I'll move us into a little presentation here so you guys can see some of these ducks that we're talking about. So for our nature guardians who are watching, we've probably seen, oh, I'd say maybe five of these ducks here um, in our travels at Shuby. There's definitely some here that I know we haven't seen at Shuby because it's not quite the right habitat type. Um, let's see how much you guys maybe know about these ducks too. If you guys have any questions or if you think you know the answer to any of the questions we're going to ask you guys, feel free to go ahead and stick those in the chat and you can tell us where you're tuning in from today if you like. Identifying ducks is no easy task for sure. It kind of depends on the duck that you're looking at. I like to keep these three things in mind. So there's size, patterns, and behavior. So size is kind of hard if you are only looking at one duck and if it's way out in the ocean, there's nothing to compare it to. That can be really tricky. But if you're lucky enough to have a couple ducks together and you can compare size between them, or maybe the duck is near something that you, you know the size of really well, maybe it's in a wetland and you know how big the, the grass that it's next to is, that could be a good way of figuring out relatively how big the duck you're looking at is. Um, we'll talk a bit about patterns. I didn't include color here um, for an important reason, and that's because sometimes, maybe very often, ducks are so far away that it's hard to tell exactly what colors you're looking at, especially if we're looking at those kind of bluish, greenish, 
subtle, they're almost black colors. Um, but we can talk a bit about patterns um, with respect to black and white, where the black and where the white are on the bird can be really helpful. And then behavior. So what is the duck doing? There's a couple of different types of ducks in Nova Scotia, and you might be able to figure out at least what group of ducks you're looking at based on what they're doing, um, or maybe how they're doing that thing. So if they're eating, are they diving? Uh, are they dabbling? Do they have their bums up in the air? Um, how are they flying? What do they move like? Those can all be really good, uh, really good keys for identifying ducks. Something else that might make a difference here, Becky, is a time of year too. Like a lot of birds, mm. um, the ducks will change their feather patterns in the winter versus in the spring. Uh, so at this time of year, it's maybe the easiest because they have their um, their breeding feathers on, especially the males, and you get those really distinctive patterns mostly at this time of year. Definitely. Yeah, that's a really good point. So Emma, I guess, so what kind of ducks would we be looking for right now where it's kind of transitioning into that warmer period of spring or kind of in between winter and summer duck time? Yeah, yeah, good question. So in a way, in the winter is one of the best times to see ducks if you live by the coast because they tend to hang out in harbors and uh, near beaches in groups during the winter um, and this might be the beginning of the time of year where some ducks will start to head off onto their nesting areas so um, more sea ducks like eiders that we'll talk about later will start to head to offshore islands soon so they'll be a bit harder to see them but a lot of other ducks will be heading inland and I know they're not ducks but um, loons will start to head to the inland lakes soon to breed if they haven't done so already and start to get their beautiful breeding plumage. Um, so you might, this is kind of the, that transition time. So you might see some birds coming closer to shore or uh, moving on to lakes or wetlands near you. Yeah, yeah. So we'll go over a couple of those. Probably the best thing to do first, I think is talk about some ducks that you might be seeing around the city. Most of our nature guardians and a lot of our YNC families are in Halifax. Uh, and if you're in the HRM right now, you're stuck in the HRM right now. So, so you might be seeing um, ducks that are hanging out right now in, in parks or maybe in your backyard if you're lucky enough to have water back there. Um, or like Emma said, if you're on the coast, some of these ducks can be seen around uh, can be seen around the harbor as well. But let's start with these, these, I guess what I would call park ducks or what you're really likely to see. I'll bring up a picture here. So these are two ducks that are related, um, but probably I mean, one is way more common at Shuby where we've been doing a lot of our action projects. So this is the black duck and mallard. And I also have a picture here of a hybrid between the two. So Emma, do you know much about conservation issues uh, around the black duck and why hybridization might be a concern? Yeah, so mallards are native to prairie areas and that more open landscape, whereas black ducks are more ducks of uh, forested lakes and ponds. So out in eastern Canada, since we've cleared a lot of land for agriculture and for cities, that's really, that I guess, cleared the way for mallards to move more east. Um, so I would say in more forested areas of Eastern Canada, black ducks are still more common, but the mallards tend to outcompete them in more open areas, agricultural areas and city parks because they're just uh, bigger and just tend to be more dominant. So um, yeah, I guess it's, it's really a habitat issue. So we have to make sure that we maintain that more natural forested those natural forested areas for those black ducks where they're able to, um, I, I can't say this for certain, but I, I would think that in that more forested landscape, they would be able to outcompete the mallard ducks because it's what they're more um, evolved to 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely know though. I mean, those mallards are tough because when I see people feeding them stuff at the ponds, I mean, they're really competitive. They get right in there. <laughs> a little while ago, our nature guardians went out to Shuby and we saw two little teals that were just getting like totally beaten up by the the mallards that were fighting for the food people were leaving for them. They're they're really oh, tough. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so there's two things there. So mallards are, are super too, tough ducks and competitive. And then we have a habitat issue as well, where black ducks should be more common out here. But yeah, we don't have appropriate habitat for them, especially within in the city. Then, then we're not going to see as many. So you might be seeing these hybrids. And the hybrids can look different, especially first generation hybrids. So you might see a little bit of that green on the head, like in the picture here. Um, Black duck and mallard females are pretty hard to tell apart. Um, and even sometimes the, the hybrids are, are difficult to tell apart from a, a true black duck. So, so one thing that can be a good key um, if you're able to see them is the, the bands on the wings. So in these, this picture, you'll see the black duck there has two black bands surrounding that kind of purpley blue color on the wing. And there might be a tiny bit of white, but it's not very much, but definitely those those two thick black bands. Whereas on the mallard, those bands are white. So there's that bluish color, the really thin black bands, and then quite a bit of white. So some of the white on the bottom could be worn away, but there's definitely going to be more there than there would be on the uh, on the black duck or probably on a hybrid. So so if you're able to watch your ducks for a while, have a look for those bands. Some people are really good at telling black ducks and mallards apart from the beak. Are you good at that, Emma? Because I'm not. Yeah, I think it's definitely one of those things where if seen next to another, it's easier. Um, but yeah, typically the black ducks have more of that olivey color and uh, the mallards are more yellow, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, mallards have that yellow tint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but beaks are hard. But yeah, so that goes back to our our first point about ID tips. So if you have ducks, two different ducks to compare, that can be really helpful. But one duck on its own, especially if it's like a a black duck or a mallard female, that that, that can be pretty tricky. But look for the bars in that case, I guess. All right, let's have a look at another duck. So these ducks are related to our black duck and our mallard. They're cousins, I guess you could say. So this is the northern pintail and the green winged teal. So the green winged teal is actually that that really small duck that we saw at Shuby a uh, well, month month and a bit ago now. Um, Emma, maybe you know that I'm not sure, but you seem like the person who would know this. I feel like I heard a fact at some point about the smallest duck in Canada or North America, and it is a teal, isn't it? Is it this one? I don't actually know that off the top of my head I can I can double check that yeah we'll let you guys know if we can't find out tonight definitely they're really small so if our nature guardians are watching tonight remember those ducks that we saw at Shuby they were tiny tiny they were almost half the size of the mallards that were there were super cute and little um so the pin that green winged teal is the smallest dabbling duck in North America oh there we go yeah the smallest dabbling duck so Dabbling ducks. So that's an important distinction here. So we're only looking at dabbling ducks right now. So the mallards, the black ducks, this pintail and, and green winged teal, they're dabblers. Emma, could you tell us what a dabbling duck is compared to, well, I guess, what is the other kind of duck? Yeah, so ducks are either dabblers or divers. Uh, so it, it basically is the difference of how they get their food. So a dabbling duck just flips upside down so that its butt is in the air basically and then it uh, looks for food more closer to the surface of the water whereas a diving duck will dive down for its food um, and on land diving ducks tend to be a little bit more awkward their feet are placed a little bit further back in their body and that gives them a good propulsion underwater to really propel them through as a as a diver uh, but it makes them a little bit more awkward on the land and makes sense because diving ducks tend to live um, in deeper, more open water and dabblers in more shallow water and wetlands. And so they'll spend more time on land likely than diving ducks would. So yeah. 
Yeah, so the green winged teal is the smallest dabbling duck. That makes me wonder now if there is a diving duck that is smaller than a green winged teal. There are some pretty little like ocean birds there. I guess I'll have to think about that. I think it might be the bufflehead. Oh yeah, to they're pretty small. All right, yeah, mm -hmm. we will we'll see a bufflehead in this presentation. All right, yeah, so the pintail is probably one of the obvious ones. So that northern pintail has that long tail. Um, so this distinguishes it from another duck we're going to see in a second, a long-tailed duck, um, by the uh, the color on the head there. So if uh, the two of them were far out in the water and you couldn't quite see the details, um, if you saw a duck that was mostly white looking or a good amount of white, especially on the head, that's not the pintail. That's going to be a different duck we're going to look at here. Now, these ducks get really complicated when we're looking at juvenile and females. The juvenile stages have different colorings. Um, on the northern pintail, they're just a little bit more drab. They don't have the exact same um, or the same uh, degree, the contrast there between the, the dark head and the lighter neck and chest. But uh, generally speaking, th those pintails are going to be a little bit darker looking from far away than our, our long-tailed ducks. Green-winged teals, the females can look pretty similar to other related ducks, so your, your mallards and your, your black ducks, but like we said, they're going to be a lot smaller. I haven't seen a lot of these guys around Halifax, but there are hybrid um, pintails out there because they like said you know, these guys are related to our, our mallards, our black ducks, so these ducks can hybridize. Um, Mallards seem to be hybridizing quite a bit with black ducks in Atlantic Canada, so I haven't seen a mallard pintail hybrid myself, but they are out there, and this is one example. So you can see that green head and just the kind of slightly extended tail feather there on this uh, mallard pintail. Min, min tail? Pallard duck? <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it'd be fun to dress up as a green winged teal for Halloween and like have a big stripe of green paint on your face. Oh, yeah, that would be a really interesting face painting competition. Mm. But ducks of Atlantic can't. We should do that one day. <laughs> All right, this is our other teal. So this is the blue wing teal. Um, this teal is actually not as related to the green wing teal as the green wing teal is related to those other ducks or our other dabblers up there. Um, but we do have these in Nova Scotia. So similarly to the green wing teal, these guys have that white. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that. That was Lukey under my chair. <laughs> They have that uh, that white mark on on their face, so a little different from if I can go back to our green winged teal here. That green splotch that they have goes over the eye and kind of backwards, as if they're wearing like half of a mask. Whereas the blue winged teal, that white spot that distinguishes them pretty readily, it's almost like a crescent shape that starts at the beak and kind of avoids the eye. So these guys are a little bluish. They have that blue stripe. But you're not likely to see that blue unless the bird is flying, they have their wing extended. So these ducks, in reality, I mean, let's say have really good lighting and these are really good pictures. Um, they're probably going to look a little more drab than blue. They're probably going to be a little brownish. You could mistake them with, um, with maybe a female mallard, black duck. Um, so this is where that pattern would matter. So keep an eye, especially on the males, keep an eye out for that white on, on the head. And maybe look for the spottedness around the chest. So our, especially compared to a black duck, those black ducks are a little more drab in the front. The blue winged teal is almost like speckled and going to be quite a bit smaller than our, our black duck. So this is a gadwall and an American widgeon. So the widgeon, you might think, looks similar to our green winged teal because it has that green green splotch leading from the eye backwards, but the widgeon is generally lighter overall and it's going to be bigger than our uh, our teal. If I go back to our teal here, you can see the teal's super small, has that green splotch, but also has that brown head. So your teals are going to be a little darker on average than the um, our, uh, our widgeons, even, even the, the females, which are a little more drab. But, uh, but wisions are definitely distinguished by that, that green splotch and uh, white crown over the head, if you can see where I'm pointing there. Gadwalls. I don't see a lot of these guys. They are around. Um, they're pretty drab, um, so they might remind you of a female black duck, a female mallard. Not a whole lot of markings on them, um, even the males. 
I find the easiest way to tell gadwalls apart from other ducks is by the beak. So if you're close enough to see these birds up close, the beak is very skinny and there's a more sharp drop from, I guess what you would call the forehead on a duck, onto the beak. So that's how I tell gadwall apart. Um, I don't see a whole lot of them around, but they are within HRM. I've seen a couple. Actually, Becky, and speaking of widgeons, when I lived in St. John's in Newfoundland, it was not too uncommon to see European widgeons um, as oh, as wow. vagrants come in, and they would just hang out in some of the parks in St. John's. Actually, it was St. John's was a really good place to see a lot of species that you would more see in Europe, just because they would get blown over on storms and then stay a while in the city's parks. And there's one pond in particular that was a really well-known um, gull place in February for rare gulls because they would get blown in and just stay a while in that relatively sheltered area. So yeah, so European cool. widgeons often show up <laughs> in downtown St. John's. Yeah, so European widgeons, we have seen a couple in Nova Scotia. Oh, I'm so jealous that there was like an exotic birding spot in Newfoundland. <laughs> we do see them every now and then uh, after a storm or just randomly they'll, they'll show up like like a lot of European vagrants do. Um, how would you describe a European widgeon compared to the American widgeon? Oh gosh, I don't know if I could describe that off the top of my head. I'll find you guys a picture maybe and I'll post it after the presentation. I don't think I have one in here. They're they're kind of different looking. They're they're related, obviously. They're the same um genus of duck, I think. Um related to the gadwall too. But yeah, they they look pretty different from the American widgeon. They're more and, blue. So. Yeah, I just looked it up in my Sibley's here and it's a Eurasian widgeon, I think I said European, but at least in this version of Sibley's, it was listed as Eurasian. And on all the, um, in Sibley's, there's always that range map and it's neat in most of North America, it's listed as rare, but in St. John's, there's a little blue dot, meaning that it is mostly there every winter. <laughs> so, oh, that's fun. funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, keep an eye out. We'll share a picture um, after the presentation, just in case you guys happen to see one. Not super common, but it would be around, especially if you're visiting Newfoundland once uh, once restrictions are lifted. But yeah, they're a little more blue. So I guess if I would compare the widgeons to the teals, so we have our green and our blue wing teals, and they're kind of greenish and kind of bluish. The American widgeon is kind of greenish and the Eurasian widgeon is kind of bluish. So that's, that's one way of, of thinking about them. Um, similar size too, I think though, so be tricky. Uh, let's have another look here, maybe at some different habitats. So these are ducks that I tend to see usually in bigger wetlands, so sometimes on lakes, more often in um, salt marshes or in barrier um, lakes or harbors behind uh, behind barrier beaches. So Musket Abbot Harbor would be a great place to go looking for these guys. So these are these are all cousins. These are the ringneck duck, uh, our scouts, and uh, tufted duck. So these guys at a distance can be pretty tricky to tell apart. Um, one good way to tell um, whether you have a you know a scalp or a, or a ringneck duck is the amount of white on the back. So so our ringneck duck has that solid black, um, and even juvenile ringneck ducks are a little more a little more dark um, overall than, than our, our greater and lesser scalps here, which uh, have that wide, open, whitish, kind of gray, gray, white right back. Um, also pretty solidly colored heads. So greater and lesser scalps really hard to tell apart. Um, one is kind of greenish, one is purplish, unless you're super close or you have a really good camera, you're probably not going to see that detail. Um, which is why when I'm eBirding, I put uh, scalp species on my list. Um, tufted ducks a little easier, especially if you have a mature male, because they have that cool ponytail. I don't know if those are still cool anymore. I remember in the 90s, it was cool to have a tiny, tiny ponytail. <laughs> so the tufted duck has that, that little ponytail in the back, and even the females, the juveniles, they've got just a little bit of sticky up feathers on top of the head there. 
Do you see a lot of these around, Emma? I don't see them in the city so much. The tufted ducks? Not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen ringneck ducks are not uncommon um, in on lakes in, within the city, not necessarily in central areas, but um, like lakes in McIntosh Run area, I've seen ringneck ducks. Um, down in the Purcell's Cove area and scop as you would find them in similar places, I would think. Yeah. So this could be a place where, you know, if you have a couple of these out on the water, behavior could be a good way of telling what you have. Um, birds of a feather tend to flock together. <laughs> so if you have a group of birds, uh, have a look, you know, are there different sizes, different patterns there? And from there, decide, okay, do I have different patterns because some are adults and some are juveniles? Uh, or am I seeing different patterns because I have different kinds of ducks together? So I don't often see, I, tufted ducks are not as common as these two other cousins, um, in my experience anyway, but I don't often see tufted ducks hanging out with the scalps or the ringneck ducks, but I will see ringneck ducks kind of hanging out singly um, with a group of other ducks um, or, or just hanging out on their own. Or scopes every now and then I'll see hanging out with uh, with buffalo heads or, or other ducks that are out on uh, on those salt marshes or, or behind beaches. Well, let's have a look at some other uh, big, big water, I guess, ducks here. So here's our buffalo head and two golden eyes. So this is the common golden eye and uh, much less common Barrow's golden eye. So these ducks are, are all related to each other. Um, and similarly to uh, ducks we just looked at, you can find those in uh, those barrier beach ecosystems. Sometimes you'll see them out on lakes. Um, I've seen buffalo heads in the Halifax Harbor before. Um, where else might you find these guys, Em? Uh, well, common golden eye for sure will nest inland. They nest in tree cavities, at least sometimes. Um, so they'll they might winter more in open water, but they'll uh, they'll come inland to nest. And I'm trying to think, last place I saw last place I saw a buffalo head was in um, Mahone Bay. A few, several of them together. Oh. I don't know if I've ever seen a Barrow's golden eye. I saw one once, and it was only because a professional birder pointed it out to me. So mm -hmm. a common golden eye, I mean, obviously from his name, a little more common. Um, so one way to tell, I mean, I guess if we can start with buffalo heads and, and, and golden eyes, one way to tell your buffalo head from your golden eye is the uh, the size. The buffalo heads are pretty small. Um, golden eyes aren't like huge ducks, but they're, they're bigger than the buffalo heads. And then the pattern. So especially an adult buffalo head has a pretty solid back, um, that dark back. Um, whereas the golden eyes, um, if you're looking at them through, you know, binoculars or a scope, or even with your naked eye, you might be able to see just a little bit of that, that striping or that spotted pattern on the back that kind of gradually turns into a solid black color. Um, and then telling the difference between your common golden eye and your Barrow's golden eye, which is very difficult to me, um, you're going to look for that white circle on the head. So the buffalo head has that really big circle, and even on an immature um, or on a female buffalo head, you're going to have a relatively big white patch or a white streak starting around the eye and then working towards the back of the head, especially on the males, it's really, really big. Um, but the golden eyes only have that small one, that small white circle, and it's more towards the front of the head adjacent to the beak. So the common golden eye and the Barrow's golden eye, that, uh, that splotch is differently shaped. So the common golden eye is a little more round. Barrow's golden eye is a little bit more oblong, almost like a teardrop shape. Really subtle difference, really hard to pick up on. That's why I have never picked out a Barrow's golden eye on my own. That combined with the fact that they're not, not very common. All right, let's look at the long-tailed duck. So I strangely don't see a whole lot of these in Nova Scotia. I saw a whole lot more in southern Ontario when I was living there. Where do you see these, Emma? I've seen a few of those recently at uh, Crystal Crescent. Yeah, actually as recently as um, last weekend. 
Oh, nice. I mean, they're definitely a fun duck to see. They're also they're pretty small, um, super cute. Males, uh, adult males have the, those long, really obvious tail feathers. Uh, if they're flying, the tail feathers, are, I mean, they're still pretty obvious, but they're not going to be up like, like this picture. They'll, they'll be down a little bit more, almost like a swallowtail. Um, generally white ducks, um, if they're male adults. Uh, juveniles, a little more drab, um, darker in color for sure. Um, younger males and uh, immature females are a little more solidly colored on the back. So kind of a, a mix of, of black and white colors there if you're looking off in the distance and, and we're looking for those patterns that we're talking about. Um, you might also look for the spot on the cheek. So in this photo here, on that uh, that juvenile male so we have the adult male above and we have a juvenile male and a female down below that male is just developing the darker neck so he's got a little spot on his cheek there that is slowly kind of moving down the neck towards the back and then the rest is is pretty dark still so tricky duck if they're if they're young or if they're female um, but definitely look for the size and, and look for the pattern there All right, let's talk about some ocean birds, birds that you're going to find in open water, maybe even really far out to sea. So these are our scoters. Emma, do you say scoter? Have you said scotter? Somebody said scotter to me the other day. No, I, I've only ever said scoter, although I think we differ in how we say scot. You say, sorry, that was my cat ah. meowing. You say <laughs> scout? Scout, I say, yeah. I say scop, but anyway, to each their own. <laughs> Common names are tricky. <laughs> I, my entire life, have always wanted to call plovers plovers. I just don't like reading. I don't like reading plover. <laughs> it looks like it should be plover, the same way that this is scoter. <laughs> okay. But that would be, I, exactly, that's, that's the reaction I get. <laughs> so our, our uh, scoters, or scotters, if you're my weird friend, uh, are really dark usually pretty small, um, uh, non, nondescript uh, looking ducks. You're going to see these on the ocean. Um, be pretty unusual to see these inland, um, or especially on land. That, that usually indicates there's been a problem. Maybe after a hurricane or a really strong storm, you might see these guys inland, in which case they, they might need some help. Um, are we on a different type of duck here now, Em? These are our divers? Yep. Yeah, these would be a couple of the ones we've seen so far being diving ducks. Yeah. And you can almost see in that picture of the white winged scoter how far back those pink legs are um, on the bird. You can imagine on land they would be pretty awkward. Yeah, so really hard to walk when your legs are meant for diving. So far, far at the back, almost like fish fins more than more than legs. Um, so these guys are far out to sea. You might see them this close if you're out on maybe a whale watching tour. Um, but generally speaking, they're going to be little dots <laughs> on the waves. Um, maybe even further out than the waves, they'll be, they'll be riding the currents out there. Um, but there are ways to tell the difference between them. So if you are out on a whale watching trip and you happen to get this close. So our, our black scoter is all black, super dark bird. Our white wing scoter has just a little bit of white. If its wings are folded like this, if it's flying, you can see quite a bit more white. And it has almost like a very fashionable white eyelash going on. And then our surf scoter has quite a bit more white on it. So white on the top of the head, back of the neck, and a little bit around the wing, which you can't see too well in, in this photo here. So, but again, uh, you know, your females, our immature males, they're going to be a little more drab than these guys. So scoters are really difficult to tell apart, especially if you're looking from shore. So if you're interested in seeing these guys, I mean, I would definitely recommend bringing out a, uh, a scope. Uh, or some binoculars for sure to the beach, um, or heading out on a on a whale watching or or bird watching tour. Yeah, some other diving ducks. I passed our yeah. So some of those ducks that I said I was seeing out in uh in the salt marshes are divers too. So our our golden eyes are those those are divers, right, Emma? What about buffleheads? Buffleheads for sure. I think golden heads are as well. You can kind of see the leg in our, our common golden eye photo. It's pretty pretty far back there. 
Yeah, so that that's another um, behavior key that can help you identifying these ducks. So you know, if you're out in a certain environment and you're seeing a little duck, you might think, oh, it's a teal, because I know that the green winged teal is the smallest duck in North America, but it could be a bufflehead. So look for the pattern, you know, consider where you are. Are we at the beach or are we in a, in a park? All right, these are our eiders. So our common eider and our king eider, two that we have in Nova Scotia. So common eiders, uh, you're way more likely to see these guys, hence the name. Um, pretty pretty easy bird to tell apart from others uh, i think even if they're they're far away so the adult males for sure you know they've got that that really distinct white and black pattern so they have that kind of black cap white back or shoulder and then a mostly black wing um, you're going to see a more exciting pattern if they're flying, but still very pretty obvious um, distinctions between black and white. They also have that really distinct head, which you might not be able to see as well in this uh, small photo, but the slope from the, the duck's forehead to the end of its bill is really smooth, right? So it's not as angled as some of those other ducks. So remember I said our gadwall had a really extreme slope, almost like a ski slope to its beak. Common eider has that really, really big forehead and, and forward, I guess you would call it like the bridge of a nose, but it's a beak. <laughs> and then our king eider has a really cool head so and beak. So that actual beak part, super tiny, super dark red, and then it has this huge yellow. Is there a name for the that piece on a king eider, Emma? Do you know? Um, Let's see. I wonder if they name it in the... I don't know if it's maybe just another piece of beak. But. Yeah, orange bill and bluish crown. You'd think it would have a more dramatic name, though. Yeah, I mean, I guess it is. It's just more beak and head, so it's not anything special, but it is it's very large and colorful, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, so these guys are quite a bit smaller than our common eiders, um, but have that really dramatic head. So if you're looking out uh, over the waves and you're seeing what looks like an eider, but it doesn't have quite as much black and it's a little too small, that could be a king eider. So that would be a really exciting find. I almost never see these guys. I see common eiders all the time, but I almost never see king eiders. Super cool birds. Um, Emma, I know Ducks Unlimited has been involved with eider research for a few years. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I, I guess another good identifying fact I'll say about eiders is that they are the largest sea duck in the northern hemisphere. So they are they do look quite chunky compared to other birds out on the water. So that's a really good identifying feature. Um, yeah, so we have a long-standing stewardship program with eider nest shelters. So I'm most familiar with this program in Newfoundland and Labrador, where there's a large population of breeding eiders. Uh, but we've also done this on offshore islands in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia as well. But on a lot of these islands, a lot of the natural shelter has been removed. So typically they'll nest under low shrubs or low trees. Um, or in rocky areas under shrubs, and that gives them shelter from aerial predators like gulls um, and also any mammals that happen to get on the island. So uh, on areas where that natural shelter is lost, then we've worked with volunteers to build these shelters. And they're, the original design was like a long, low, very maybe... 20 centimeter high wooden box that we would lay on the ground. And then the hen, the female duck would um, nest underneath that box. Uh, lately, researchers have come up with a different design that is less likely to collapse over time. And it's more of like a A-frame tent um, and they're lighter as well to carry around and you can fit more on the boat to bring out to the island and they're just slats of wood that come together in an a like this and they allow for more air circulation as well and they can regulate the temperature better inside um, and there's an entrance at both ends so that if there is a predator that comes to one end then the female can escape with the young at the other end of the nest shelter so there's some cool design features for them, um, but still, I think they're still testing that um, in the Maritimes. So might see more of those out around in future years. But another thing that we've 
uh, partnered a lot on in terms of research of eiders is their population numbers. So it's come out that a lot of the populations around here have declined, whereas a lot of the populations a bit further north have increased. So it's thought now that maybe um, climate change is causing a lot of species shifts, including in food sources for eiders. Um, so they eat a lot of uh, blue mussels, for example. So over time, uh, as the oceans warm up and their food sources shift north, then you could expect that common eider populations would shift north as, shift north as well to follow that food source. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll have to follow along and see if uh, our nature guardians can participate in some uh, some stewardship projects for for eider eider boxes at some point. Mm. Yeah, and that's interesting. That I wonder if that explains why I'm seeing varying numbers of eiders now compared with when I was a kid. I feel like in some places I've I've seen more, and some I've seen less, um, way less down home actually. Yeah, there. So typically, eiders are one of those birds that group together in huge flocks in the winter time and they would typically flock in similar places every year and there's whole uh, areas where they would have been seen for generations in these big floating flotillas of hundreds or thousands of birds and some of those have disappeared completely in in Nova Scotia um, and same with the nesting islands there are some islands where they just don't nest at all anymore um, and some of that could be due to human disturbance. So they would have once nested closer to Halifax and now more people live here. So that could be a factor. Um, but it's not just a simple matter of their numbers overall declining because there are populations further north that are fairly stable or even increasing. So still definitely an ongoing uh, research question for sure. It's so interesting. Yeah, that's why it's important to record your birding sightings, I suppose. So if you're on eBird and you're seeing eiders, count them and and stick them in there. So we can figure out what's going on. Absolutely. All right, let's have a look at another duck here. This is our harlequin duck. Emma, do you know much about these guys? I know ducks has had programs around these ducks before. I don't know very much about them. Yeah, I mean, I know they are listed. I forget what their exact designation is, but their numbers are pretty low. Um, I know that they are, they like to hang out in very rough waters. So the outlets of rivers and the, um, that kind of frothy wild water that you find right next to rocks on the, on the seashore. And like if you're in Duncan's Cove or a place I've seen them a lot is Kedgy Seaside, then that is, those are some of the places that they tend to be found. Um, but I think they are threatened or at risk or something. Um, but they are certainly a very beautiful duck, especially the male, as you can see there. Yeah, so pretty. Yeah, so identifying these ducks, is, I mean, these are a little easier, I think, than, than some other um, ducks, just where they are. Sometimes you'll see them a little bit closer to shore, or uh, you can easily spot them with a, with a scope or binoculars, but they, they tend to be quite a bit darker than, um, than some other birds you might see out on, on the open ocean. Um, and they're not super big, so, so those could be two keys um, to help you ID these ducks. And of course, if you have one of those adult males, you're going to see these really dramatic uh, patterns, um, the white, the spots on the head, that um, that crescent, um, and those, uh, those white patches on the back. Um, these guys are also really interesting when they fly. I never see them flying. I always see them hanging out in the water, but they, they do have pretty extreme patterns on their, on their wings. Um, but yeah, even the, the the females and the juvenile males generally pretty pretty dark. So so if you're looking, you know, and thinking, oh, okay, is this an eider? Is this a golden eye? If it's a little darker, you know, maybe maybe that could be a harlequin duck. Um, but where they're not as common, um, you're probably going to see these other ducks uh, way more often than you will see this guy for sure. Um, but keep an eye out, uh, and if you are an eBird, definitely definitely report these sightings. All right. 
Let's head back inland to talk about our last duck. So this is us at Shuby. Uh, I believe that this is just that that first pond off of the trail when you come down off of um, Lock Road there. We're going to talk about the wood duck. So this is probably the prettiest duck that we have in Nova Scotia, or I think so. Um, so really, really obvious. I mean, if you're seeing an adult male, you know, hard to mistake this for anything else. Um, I suppose they're they're not that dissimilar from our, our harlequin duck back, back here, um, but definitely very different habitats. So our, our wood duck is going to be living near trees in freshwater for sure. Harlequin duck you're going to be seeing along the coast. Um, wood ducks are pretty easy to tell apart from others, um, even if you've got a female or a, an immature uh, juvenile uh, male. The uh, female here has that white white circle around the eye. Sometimes it's like a teardrop shape. Um, juveniles are going to have a little bit of white white on them as well, becoming um, those markings becoming more obvious as they they age. Um, but pretty pretty easy to tell apart. They're not a huge duck either. They're relatively small. Um, this is an ID feature, but it's something cool about these ducks that allows them to live in the habitat that they live in. Um, they have little claws on the ends of their webbed feet, which is so neat for a duck that lives in very two different very habitats, I guess. Um, so in one of our pictures here, you can see there's a duck actually sitting on top of a wood duck box. So I guess this box was successful. So uh, before uh, the new restrictions were put in place in HRM, we were going to go out to Shuby and put up one of these boxes um, that we actually got from Ducks Unlimited Canada. And we're going to put together and, and put up uh, along one of our, our freshwater uh, water quality monitoring sites there. Um, so instead, uh, our nature guardians have a challenge to do, and I'm going to give away that box as a prize, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but Emma, I wonder if you could tell us about wood duck boxes in general, um, and why why we do this, what makes those boxes successful, and what's what's the point in even creating these? Why why did the wood ducks need them? Yeah, so. Wood ducks nest in tree cavities and they tend to require kind of a specific type and size. So they like a, a bit more of a larger diameter tree that's hollowed out inside. So those nice snags that you sometimes see. Um, sometimes that type of habitat is hard to find. So it's being removed or has blown down or, or burned or something like that. So that is why uh, we started this, uh, that's why people build nest boxes to provide that additional nesting habitat. And there's a couple of features on the boxes. So uh, the hole is specifically sized to allow for wood ducks to enter, but not any predators like raccoons or anything like that. Um, on the inside of the box, volunteers put fresh shavings to mimic what you might find inside a tree cavity, a nice soft layer for the ducklings to nest. And there's also usually a little piece of mesh just underneath the window inside the box that they can use to climb up and out. So to kind of mimic the roughness of the inside of a tree cavity. Um, so we've been working with volunteer nest box stewards in all Atlantic Canadian provinces and um, and Quebec and Ontario as well, I, Ontario for sure. And it's a really good program for volunteers because you can go out and check it every year and it has to be cleaned out and you can take pictures. We actually have a volunteer in New Brunswick who has uh, sets up a nest box every year and puts a little web camera in it. So I think it, you can go online now and see the I think it's either wood duck or a golden eye in there and you can see them move around and lay eggs and uh, watch the eggs hatch and all that. It's pretty cool. Oh, fun. We'll have to post a link to that after the presentation for sure. Mm. Yeah. So I know lumber is really expensive right now. So I, this might not be everybody's uh, choice project for, uh, for while you're stuck in, in the city, but if you happen to have some wood lying around, it's a great project to take on. Um, if you're hoping to do some, some duck stewardship. But there are a lot of other things you can do as well. So something that our nature guardians have done a lot of already um, are nest box installations. So we've put up a couple wood duck boxes before. We've done some songbird boxes, but um, we've also done some shoreline cleanups. 
Um, Emma, I know, I don't know if you know anything about this. I know you're really into plants like I am, but I know that Ducks has done some research on um, plastic pollution and duck feeding habits. You know anything about that? Uh, I I don't really actually know. That's all right. I will post some links later if folks are interested in learning. But we do know. I mean, this probably isn't surprising that you know, like a lot of other birds that live on on the ocean or near near shorelines, that uh, plastic pollution is a big problem for them. Both both for entanglement uh, and because some of these items will be eaten. Um, so I do know that some of the things you can see in the picture here have actually ended up in the stomachs of different duck species. So in the photo here, you can see there's lobster bands, there's a straw there, like a spool, and some plastic bits, uh, broken broken plastic bits, and some cigarette butts. Lots of nasty stuff that we don't want on our beach. So while you guys are stuck at home or around your neighborhood, if you're near a shoreline, it doesn't have to be a marine shoreline or a beach. It could be a freshwater shoreline. It could be a ditch. Any kind of cleanup you could do that would get uh, plastics and other garbage out of uh, out of your watershed would, would definitely benefit ducks and a whole bunch of other species too. So that's a great stewardship project you can take on at home. Um, if you're interested in nest boxes, we do have a, we have a link here and I'll share another one um, after the presentation where you can find out more about how to build uh, a duck box, you know, what size you want to aim for, what kind of hole, um, you know, what kinds of materials you might want to use, like Emma was mentioning, so that it's really a suitable habitat for them. Um, but you might also want to think about where you're going to place that box. So if you don't have uh, a nice lake or stream or, or some suitable habitat at home, this could be a great project for a park. Just make sure you're asking whoever is in charge of the, the land there. Um, or maybe at the cottage once we're allowed to travel outside the city again. Um, or, or even, you know, down the street if you have a nice little wetland at the end of your road, your court. Duck boxes are, are great to put up in lots of places. Um, but also think about, you know, other dangers there for the duck. So think about where you're putting that box up. Um, we don't want to be creating um, hazards for ducks where they don't already exist. So think about things like uh, predation. Emma, what would you be thinking about if we were putting up a duck, set, or a duck box at Shuby today? What kinds, of, um, what kinds of dangers would we be looking for? Where would we not want to put a, a box? Yeah, definitely height above the ground is an important consideration. Um, so a lot of people, this might not be as relevant here where we don't get too much snow, but a lot of people will put them up in the winter so that uh, they are a meter above the ground on the snowpack. And then when the snow melts, the box is a little bit higher up. That was more relevant in Newfoundland when they would actually get a meter of snow. <laughs> That's so relevant here. Um, often, and in a couple of the pictures that you showed, they're on metal poles, and that helps a bit for squirrels too, as opposed to putting them uh, right on the tree. Uh, distance to the water is important, so you have to remember that when the ducklings come out, they are basically helpless, and they kind of have to walk along the ground until they get to the water. So, I think it's usually. Um, three or four meters back from the water that you'd want to put the box, not more than that. Um, yeah, I think that's what comes to mind off the top of my head. Probably if you go to that link there or search uh, wood duck nest boxes on Google, then there might be some more placement tips there too. There's a couple boxes at Shuby when you first come in that are in the water now in that little that swamp when you first come down uh, the it's a parking lot for the the off leash dog park there. I'm not sure if those were put there intentionally or if that area has flooded since they were put in. But would you recommend putting them directly in the water if that's an option? Um, I think I I have seen that before. I guess it might depend on the species. I think. With golden eyes, maybe it was a little bit further back, but with wood ducks, it could be right in the water. I'd, I'd have to double check that though. All right, well, we can answer that question afterwards and we'll, we'll post a, an answer in, on uh, Facebook. Uh, so and another thing on our, our list here is, uh, is really wetland policy. So protecting wetlands, protecting islands, so places where these birds are gonna be nesting, where they're feeding. Um, 
I know we've talked about wetland policy a little bit with our, our Nature Guardians chapter before, but we haven't really explored it in much depth. Um, Emma, could you tell us a bit about wetland policy in Nova Scotia and what, what protections we already have for wetlands and how could how could our Nature Guardians or any youth in Nova Scotia contribute to wetland policy if they were interested? Yeah, so in Nova Scotia, we're pretty lucky. We have a good provincial wetland conservation policy. And under that policy, um, if anyone would like to disturb a wetland, they have to submit a permit to do so. Uh, and then they have to compensate or pay to make up for the loss of that wetland. But first they have to prove that they can't avoid disturbing it in the first place. Um, so if they have to disturb, say one hectare of wetland, then they have to pay to compensate and restore two hectares of wetland somewhere else. So the idea behind the policy is to have no net loss of wetlands in the province. So if uh, three hectares of wetland are lost, then um, we'll get six hectares of restored wetlands somewhere else. So uh, restored wetlands are important and we're getting better at restoring wetlands every year, but they'll never be as good as the natural wetland that was lost. And that's why the ratio is at least two to one so that, that you have to restore two hectares for every one hectare of natural wetland that's lost. Um, in terms of what, you can do. I always say that one of the most important things is to go out and enjoy wetlands and places that have lots of public use and trails and people who love them and care for them are always a little bit more protected because uh, people who make those policies, they see that they are enjoyed by people um, and politicians see that they're being enjoyed and valued by the community. So it adds a layer of, uh, of protection for those places. And the more people care about wetlands, the more support they will be for their broad protection. So just going out for a hike and enjoying wetlands and learning about them and talking about them is a really important thing to do. Yeah, that's really good advice. Yeah, so if you care about wetlands and if you're interested in protecting wetlands, definitely the best thing to do is just get out there and enjoy them. So, so we have a challenge for our nature guardians because we couldn't gather together. Um, so for our nature guardians who are watching uh, or those who are going to watch later in our, our recording, we've sent out some details uh, via email. So what you're going to do uh, if you'd like to participate is sometime between now and the, uh, when did I say, May, think or the end of May. Go out looking for some ducks, report as many as you can, both species and number of individuals. If you're on eBird, you can use eBird or you can use classic pen and paper, that's up to you. Um, but if you share your submissions with us, I'm going to enter you into a draw for that uh, that nest box that we were going to put up. Uh, and I have a couple other like runner-up prizes as well. So, so definitely get in on that challenge. Um, our Halifax chapter, because they're also stuck at home, they're also going to be running a uh, at-home challenge around the city nature challenge. How many times can I say challenge here? Um, so watch out for that. The details will come out in the next couple of days. Um, so you can include the duck numbers, <laughs> duck species that you're going to include for this challenge in that challenge as well. There will be prizes for that as well. Um, so keep an eye out um, in your emails if you're subscribed to the Halifax chapter, um, or we'll put them up on Facebook as well. Um, but yeah, so that's a great way to get out to your local wetlands. So if you have a pond, I mean, if you're lucky, you have one right in your backyard, a pond, a swamp, anything, um, get out to those, those spots, walk down the road, make sure you're socially distancing, uh, and share what you're finding. So share them with us. Um, we'll share what everyone shares, uh, to Facebook. Um, but you know, send, send some letters. Maybe if you find something really cool, I mean, reach out to your, your MLA, say, hey, I found this cool duck, send them a letter, draw them a picture. That's probably the best way that we, we could continue to protect wetlands in Nova Scotia is by yeah, telling people how, how cool they are and how much we love them and the ducks that live there. Um, that's it for tonight, folks. So we'll let you go. Um, I will post some links um, 
some information that we talked about in this presentation and some stuff that Emma told us about, um, both in this uh, recording, which will be up on YouTube, and to our main Facebook page, uh, as well as to the Nature Guardians Facebook group. So wherever you go, you should be able to find it. Um, thanks so much for joining us again, Emma, and telling us about wetlands. Definitely one of my favorite topics. Oh, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, guys, stay safe. And hopefully we're going to see you in a month. Uh, and if it's not a month, hopefully it's no more than two months. Um, but yeah, stay safe. Get outside. Enjoy nature. Yeah. And, and try to have some fun. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.